of the Lord one more time. God has been good to us. He has allowed us to come into his sanctuary one more time. We are so grateful. We are so thankful for him for allowing us to be here Amen. one more time. Amen. Through danger seen and unseen, God has kept us. He has bestowed his mercy and his grace upon Amen. us. Amen. Oh, magnify the oh, Lord magnify with me. The Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Because the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endures to all generations. Oh, come, let us worship together. Let us kneel down before the Lord our maker. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this blessed opportunity to come together one more time. Father God, we thank you for keeping us from last Sunday to this Sunday. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have kept the deaf angel at bay this week in our congregation. We're grateful this morning, oh Father God. Grateful. We're thankful, Father God, that you have allowed our sick to their golden moments to roll on a little while longer. Yes. Oh dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you just bless the woman of God today as she brings forth the word of God. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that it doesn't fall on fallow ground, Father, but it falls on rich soil, God. Yes. And that we not just be hearers, but we be yes. doers, Father God. That you prick in our hearts that we need to be about your business. Yes. Oh dear Heavenly Father, we pray for our congregation that's here. We yes. pray for our congregation that will be listening later. Yes. Be with him, Father God. In Jesus' name we pray. Name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We will be going to the book of Psalms, Psalms 50, and we'll start at verse 5. And we will be reading responsibly from verse 5 down to verse 16. Psalms 50, starting at verse 5. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And the heavens shall declare his righteousness. For God is God himself. Selah. Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, yeah. and I will testify against thee. I am God, uh, even thy God. Yes. I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices or thy burnt offerings that have been continually before me. I will take no bullocks out of thy house, nor he goats out of the fold. For every beast of the fields is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains, <laughs> and the wild beasts of the fields are mine. Mm -hmm. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine, and the fullness thereof. Well, I will eat the flesh of bulls, or drink the blood of goats. Honor unto God and spit and pay thy vows unto the Most High. And call upon me hmm. in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee and shall glorify me. Altogether. But unto the wicked God saith, What hast thou to do to declare my statutes? Or that thou shouldst say my covenant in thy heart? Passage is tight. 
title, Healing the Ten Lepers. All right. And we are in the Gospel according to Luke, looking at the 17th chapter, beginning at verse 11. Amen. Reading through verse 19. Amen. I'm going to be reading out of the authorized version of 1611, best known as the King James Translation. Mm -hmm. And it came to pass, as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Mm -hmm. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, mm -hmm. which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices mm -hmm. and said, Jesus, yes. Master, mm -hmm. have mercy on us. Mm -hmm. And when he saw them, mm -hmm. yes. he said unto them, Go, show yourselves unto the priests. Mm -hmm. And it came to pass that as they went, uh -huh. they were cleansed. Yes. Yes. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, Turn back yeah. and with a loud voice uh -huh. glorified God yes. and fell down on his face at his feet, uh -huh. yeah. giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. Uh -huh. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? Uh -huh. But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Amen. Hallelujah for the word of God. Bless the Lord. Bless your name, Jesus. Bless your holy and precious name. He is my friend. Is Jesus your friend this morning? Praise God, he's my friend. He's my friend, and my friend is in charge of my life. My friend directs me, he tells me what to do. And he lets me know every day of my life that I don't belong to myself that he is in charge of me and everybody else. Everybody else might not know it, but he really is in charge. As we have come this morning to a full house. <laughs> well, you know why we're in a full house? Because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are here. There are no empty pews, the house is full. And we thank God for those who are here we thank God for those who are listening in media and in homes, and we are just so grateful that we can be here this morning. We don't know how long it will be, 
or what the future holds for us, but right now, Leon, we know that we are in the house of the Lord and we are so grateful to be here. Uh, this morning, I've been thinking about this um, message all week long and I was wondering if I was off target as I often do all week long. And so as the Lord centered my heart and my thoughts here from last Sunday, when I made the statement that ingratitude, ingratitude is a sin, and ingratitude is a sin. To be ungrateful makes you an ingrate. It means that you don't know how to say thanks for things people have done for you and to you. And so it makes you uh, become an ingrate. Uh, today there's an epidemic of pessimism that's hanging all over the world. There's fear, anxiety, hopelessness, and a world of complaints all over the world. And we are enjoying telling each other, someone told me on yesterday, well, Sister Minnie, you have to socialize sometime. And Deacon Leonard, I said to that person, I socialize every day of my life. <laughs> I don't live in that house alone. The Lord is there. Not only he's my, my keeper, he's my shepherd, he's my savior, he's my, and he's my best friend. Amen. So all over the world, these feelings has brought about a disconnect between many Christians and their God and our God. And, and it has caused an attitude of ingratitude to flourish among us because we don't have things just like we want to have them. We can't go where we want to go and do what we want to do. And much of what we want to do had nothing to do with God's will in our life. They're socially dis distancing ourselves from God. And that's a dangerous thing to do, Robert. It's dangerous to distance yourself from God because we need him, as Pastor Washington said, we need him in the morning, we need him at the noontime, and we need him at night. And we, we are, we've started to act like the children of Israel. The general complaint is, I feel like I'm, I'm on lockdown. I'm tired of being in the house. I want to go out and socialize and get with my boys or my girls or my gang uh, or my associates. And this spirit of dissatisfaction, of ingratitude, instead of waking up in the morning and saying, so glad I'm here in Jesus' name. So glad you woke me up this morning. So glad my bed wasn't my colon board, uh, Willie. So glad I'm here in Jesus' name. What a pathetic response that is on the lips of Christians. What an awful response it is to Thessalonians 5.18. Paul says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God concerning you. And when he says you, he's talking about his children. There's a certain expectation if you belong to him as to how you ought to act and react to everything. Because when you're in Christ, everything is good according to Romans 8, 28, because he's God. He makes everything work for good on our behalf. But this is how the nation of Israel acted toward God. After he had fed them and clothed them and they mumbled and they grumbled and he cared for them, he defended, he delivered, and, and they grumbled and they grumbled. And, and uh, I, I was very amused as I saw one time, Carmen, that the Lord sent fiery serpents into the camp. And, he, and they, bit, they just went around and bit them. And, and then God came back, and because of Moses, he gave them a way out, and he had Moses to put a serpent on the pole, and they could and be healed. And of course, that, that if I could go straight now to the cross, but I won't, because Jesus was on the cross, and, and he took our sin. And, uh, amen. Yes. So some of us who are complaining and grumbling now ought to think about how our actions are being viewed by Almighty God. As we come to the, this day that we call Thanksgiving, this day that was set apart by George Washington, first president of the United States, and if you read the proclamation by the man, you can't help but think how low uh, presidents have sunk since then because George Washington believed in the only true and living God. George Washington believed that God created the heavens and the earth. And so when he came out and made the proclamation, 
He said, we want a day where we publicly come out and say, thank you, Jesus, for all you've done for us. That's the kind of president we had then. Then we had another president. His name was Abraham Lincoln. He came out and he made a proclamation. His proclamation said this. He said, God has blessed us more than any nation on earth. And in a short time, we've been able to bring about a nation that, that in a way that no other country has ever been able to bring it about. God has been more than good to us. And he said this as much as he has blessed us, he said, but we have forgotten God. And that puts Israel right in that space right there. Right there. Because Israel had forgotten God. And I said last week and in, in previous weeks, it's a dangerous thing to forget God. And so what value does he put on thanksgiving? Uh, let's see how he deals with it and what his view is, is toward thanksgiving as opposed to our view. Because our view is that this one day, this Thanksgiving day, Will, is a, not only do we desecrate it by eating and forgetting where our food came from, but we sit at the table with sales papers, seeing what we're going to get for Christmas. And, and, and we're talking about Black Friday. More than Thanksgiving, Black Friday. Because we can't wait to get out to the stores and pay our tithes. We can't wait to get there and use our credit cards. We can't wait to get there and use God's money to get things for our children and people that we love more than we love him. And that's the truth. That's the truth. And, but he has a different view because I learned from the scriptures, Bridget, that God likes to be thanked. He likes, he, he likes to hear from us. He likes to hear us say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You've been so good. I love you, Father. He, he likes that. He likes that. And when he doesn't get it from, it from his children, he gets disturbed. So in, 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 in the 50th Psalm, in the 50th Psalm today, in the 50th Psalm, he comes down because he says, he says, uh, you had a lesson recently. God confronts sin. Well, he comes to the temple in the 50th Psalm and he confronts the awful sin of ingratitude. He comes down to speak to his people about the sin of ingratitude. Ingratitude. Ingratitude, uh, like uh, tithing, ingratitude in Thanksgiving is like in tithing. You know when you have disobeyed. It's, it's not like you don't know because you know good and well whether or not you're paying a tithe or whether you're just throwing in something you want to throw in. Maybe you're throwing in the leftover change, you know. Uh, or maybe you're scrounging around in there for a dollar when it ought to be a hundred dollar bill. But, but, but it's sort of like the sin of not tithing. You, you know, you know when you've been ungrateful. You know when you haven't given to God the thanks that, and that's all he's asking you to do. Sacrifice of thanksgiving, the sacrifice of thanksgiving. So uh, in this 50th Psalm, we find the, the writer discussing uh, God's coming. And he's coming down into the temple. And he's coming in to correct and rebuke his people. Because Israel must know that the God that is coming down to see them today, the God that is mentioned in verses 1 through 6, the God of Z who is coming from Zion is the same God. He's the same God that was in Mount Sinai. Now, that God does not play. He does not play. That God is the covenant God. If J.R. was here, he would say he has three names. He's, he's L E L. Then he's Elohim. And then he's Jehovah God. He does not play. And when he shows up, he doesn't only show up as judge. He shows up as king. He shows up as the one who owns everything. He shows up as creator God. He shows up as punishing God. He shows up to say, you've done me wrong. 
and I'm going to do you back. The mighty God, even the Lord, even the Lord is what the scripture says. The Lord calls his covenant people to account as they met him before in worship at the temple. There is accountability in our relationship with God. You can disconnect all you want to. God is everywhere all the time. He knows all about you. And he's going to call you into accountability and say, why have you forgotten me? And we as a race of black people ought to hear that this morning because we came up out of slavery. And once we got out of slavery, we were just like the Jews. We wanted to become like the white folks. We, we were not satisfied with who we were. We wanted to be as good as they were. We didn't feel good enough as we were. We got bothered with how we were. We wanted to become like them. And so we became like one of our famous singers. She was singing gospel music, and now she's gone and she's worshiping another God. There's only one God. There's only one God. His name, Oprah, is Jehovah. Jehovah God. Only one God, the mighty God. When Moses renewed the covenant between the Lord and Israel on the plain of Moab, he called heaven and earth to serve as a third party witness. Uh, it's in Deuteronomy 30, 19, 31 to 28. You don't have to go there. So as he did that, and as he did that then, he does that now. He summons heaven and earth to testify that this present word to his people is in complete accord with the covenant. His, he is the covenant God. He told them at Sinai what he wanted them to do. The first commandment tells them what he wants them to do. And if you're gonna love him and then come up in his face with another God and throw some animals up on the altar and you think he's gonna take that? Well, perfection, he's, 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 he's God. He's God all by himself. He is completely perfect. And he comes in in verse uh, 2 in, in Psalm 50. He comes in, he's shining, he's manifesting his glory as he has come to act. He's come down to act. He didn't just come down to be there and pat them on the back and say, I really like you, but, but I'm tired of your grumbling. No, he's confronting his people, but he's not yet announcing judgment. Psalm 3 says, our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. When the Lord comes into the temple, well, you know he didn't come to judge, but you remember when he came into the temple when Isaiah was in there, and everything in the temple began to shake, and Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. God's temple is never empty. The church is never empty, COVID or no COVID. The church is never in empty. Our God shall come. No longer will he let their sins go un, un, uh, un, unpunished. No longer. No longer. When they, they see the fire, they, when, they, when they see that, they remember uh, Sinai. And they remember that he's come to judge. He's come to call an account in accordance with his covenant. And children, we are in a blood covenant. We're in a blood covenant. Not, 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 not bloody animals. No, we're in a blood covenant because of the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Remember, he's our friend and he gave himself so that we could get into the kingdom. He comes to call them to accountability. Uh, he calls for his saints, verse five. Sacrifice was a part of the ritual that sealed the covenant, Exodus 24, verses four through eight, and continued to be an integral part of Israel's expression of covenant commitment to the Lord. It was a covenant. They knew the rules. He had been very clear uh, when he came down and they had fashioned a golden calf. And uh, he told them, you know, you know he, he, he said to Moses at one point, look, I'll make a nation out of you. And Moses had to intercede for them. They were a stiff necked and rebellious and stubborn people. Sort of like some of us today, but not in St. Timothy's. So he declares, he declares, he says, he says, I'm the Lord over my people. I am the God. I am their God. I am their God. They are my people. 
And as I said to someone last week, as I was praying for St. Timothy's, I said, the flock at St. Timothy's doesn't belong to anybody but God. And God has been so favorable to St. Timothy's that it is incredible. We ought to thank him night and day because it is truly incredible. He has kept us together. Through it all, the writer said, I learned to trust in Jesus. I learned to trust in God. Through it all, he has brought us. He says, my people, they are my people, and I am their God. Whether they own me or not, I am Israel's God. I will always be their God. Israel had failed to bring sufficient sacrifices. Listen carefully and think of tithing and giving. Failed to bring sufficient sacrifices. Verse 8. But she was even tempted to think that the sacrifices were of first importance to God. Listen now. Listen. What they would do would bring the animals there and throw them on the altar and say, okay, I did my duty and leave. That was not the way he said it ought to be done. That was not what he said ought to be done. And they kept on doing it. And they kept on doing it. And now God is, is angry. God owns them no matter what they do. And you know, that's how it is because we're in Christ. We have all of this grace covering us. So no matter what we do, Willie, God owns us. When we belong to him, he disciplines us. But he doesn't kick us out of the family. He disciplines us. And if we're wise, when the Holy Spirit gets after us, we better turn around and repent and ask for forgiveness. He's a mighty good God. God says to them in verse 13, I love the way he says it. He says, I don't eat bulls and goats. These sacrifices you're putting on, I don't eat that. And especially not for the Thanksgiving offering because a Thanksgiving offering was to be shared and it had to be eaten in two days. But, but I, even, even if it wasn't a Thanksgiving offering, I don't eat goats and bulls and goats. I don't drink the blood of animals. I'm not like you. I'm not human. He said, I'm God. I am Jehovah God. I am self-sufficient. Nobody created me. <laughs> Nobody attributed, contributed to my being. I am sufficient by myself in black language. I am God all by myself. He said, I am God most high, most high. The Thanksgiving offering that I speak of uh, talks about their vows. And these vows accompanied Thanksgiving offerings. Six, Psalm 66, 13 through 15. Uh, these vows accompanied the offerings that they put on the altar. This was a different, this Thanksgiving offering was a different feast because it was a feast whereby they came and presented the animal offering on the altar. But when they came, when they came, they had to bring more than the animal offering. They had to bring a contrite spirit. They, they had to bring a heart full of repentance, a heart full of love, a feeling sorry for how I hurt you, Lord, but I'm giving you this gift because you made a way for me to atone for my sins with these animals on the altar. No, and then they were supposed to pray passionate prayers at that time, heartfelt prayers just pouring out thanksgiving to God and telling him how much he meant to them. He says in, in, in 1515, glorify me with praise. Glorify me with thanksgiving. And implicitly, he meant, be obedient to what I told you to be obedient to in the covenant. Now, they knew exactly what to do, you see, because he had told them what to do, and I'm coming to that, and you know I gotta go to Leviticus for that. But let, let's look at 1623, which I really like. I like the way God does not, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't come out like, well, I really don't want to hurt you guys. Well, I, he comes out kind of like, uh, 
I think Pastor Washington, or maybe his daughter sitting behind me might come. Uh, if you will read, here's the Lord's rebuke of the wicked. But unto the wicked God says, what right do you have to declare my statutes? Or that you should take my covenant in your mouth? You're not living my like my children. What rights do you have to speak for me? What rights do you have? And as you move on, you will see what he says. He says, consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces. That, that's, that's, that's verse 22. Consider this, ye that forget God, everyone who's listening to me anywhere, Remember this scripture, lest I tear you in pieces, and there is none to deliver you. Nobody can deliver you out of God's hands. He says, whoso offers praise glorify me, glorifies me, and he that orders his conversation aright, will I show the salvation of God. So this psalm, this psalm, and the scriptures from Luke 17 provide a framework, a framework for looking at the 10 lepers. See, the Thanksgiving offering was the first of the three feasts. It was a peace offering. So long before the proclamation of the president, God had already put in place for his people the fact that he's expecting us to offer Thanksgiving to him. And he sees Thanksgiving as an offering. Yeah. And, and uh, he's expecting it to be an offering. Offered to God in Thanksgiving to him who made a way for the nation of Israel to atone for their sins with the shedding of the blood of animals. Thanksgiving feast pointed to the once for all sacrifice that would be made by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The vow was a solemn promise to give a gift to God in response for the blessings received. How about that? These vows included, as I said, fervent, heartfelt, public prayers of grat gratitude at the altar. That's why the Thanksgiving sacrifice was so important to God. It was a feast in which his people could voluntarily pour out voluntarily that, that, that means they were going to give him something more than they would have given him before. Wow. Pour out above and beyond any offer he required. We call it the sacrificial offering. But they turned the feast of love and thanksgiving into a cold, heartless animal sacrifice. Uh, you ever had somebody to give you something and you know they didn't want to give it to you? They just gave it because they could be seen giving it. It happens a lot at banquets and other places where we're just making a show. There's no love behind it. And child, call me when you need me. And you call and you don't get an answer. You don't see them anymore. They don't really care. Uh, nobody wants to give from somebody who doesn't care. It, it, and God, certainly God doesn't. But that's how they were treating him. They had turned his feast of love into a feast of cruel, cold ingratitude so much so that he could feel it and he was wounded. Sacrifices for thanksgiving to God were the offerings were so terrible that God stopped being hurt and he became offended. So he calls them to accountability. They knew better. They knew better. God, and I said this before, when God tells us to do something, he tells us exactly how he wants it done. We can't do it our way. We have to do it. His, it's not acceptable. He has no pet children. He has no stepchildren. He is not a respecter of persons. He don't care whether you're ugly or pretty, short or tall, blind, halt the lame. The same word goes for everybody. And in Leviticus 7, 11 through 15, and Psalm 50, these two sections of scripture provide the contextual framework for why I have chosen to discuss the 10 lepers. Because in Leviticus 7, 11 through 15, we see what God wants in the Thanksgiving offering. And he, he specifies, he's very particular about everything. 
there's nothing in those scriptures that you cannot understand. He tells you exactly how to make the wafers and the bread, and he's very specific, just as he was about telling Noah to build the ark and how he told them to build the temple. And so he says, this is how it's done. This is, and this is what I will accept. This is what I will accept. And I'm expecting it to uh, come to pass because you and I are in covenant. Yeah. I am your God. You are my people. And so I'm expecting you to keep your part of the covenant. Yeah. And so here we are, Psalm 50, Leviticus 7, 11 through 15. And I'm taking you from there to the 10 lepers. Why? Because these 10 lepers offer us a paradigm, offer us an example of what it looks like to forget God and to be ungrateful. That's number one. <laughs> number two, it gives us a classic example of what it means, what it looks like for somebody to give to God exactly what he wants. And so, you have 10 lepers on their way to see the priest. The 10 lepers see that they are healed. The scripture says, as, as, as they pass, as they walk, they were completely healed of the dread disease that was causing their bodies to rot away. Uh, they were, so to speak, dead men walking before. Uh, until they called Jesus. Leon, we need to hear you call him one more time. <laughs> Until, there you go, there you go, <laughs> there you go. I was thinking about you when I saw them there. Well, they said, Jesus, have mercy. All the, they lifted up their voice in chorus. They didn't have a choir director appear. They just got together and they said, look, this is our one-time opportunity. Now, no doubt they had heard that he had already healed two lepers. And, you know, watch Jesus. You know, nobody who knows Jesus, I mean, why would he go that way? Okay? Why would he? Why? Jesus is wise. Jesus is compassionate. And Jesus knew he was going to run into these ten lepers. When he saw them, when they called him, and he sees them, it was no surprise to him because you know he's God and God is omniscient. That means he knows everything. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, have mercy on us. That's a powerful prayer. You know, African Americans used to know that prayer. Lord, have mercy. When they couldn't say mercy, they said, Lord, have mercy. Lord, help me. Come by here, Lord, come by here. Th those were emergency prayers. I need you right now, Lord, come by here. I need to feel your touch, Lord. And, and, and they got answers to their prayers because they had a sense of humility. They didn't believe they deserved so much like we do today. We're calling on God today like he's a bellboy. Come by here and serve me, carry my bags, lift my burdens. Fix my finances. Get me a husband. Get me a wife. That's not why Jesus came. Lord, Master Jesus, have mercy on me. The, the word master, and I began to call him that at home this morning, Renee. I, Renee, I started calling him master this morning. Because when I woke up, I wake up every Sunday morning, and I'm not ready, Ralph. I'm, I'm not ready, and he knows I'm not ready. And I thought to myself, that word means that he is in control. And so I faced him this morning and I said, Lord, I want you to know, and I meant it from my heart, I know you're in control because there's no way I can be ready to get into the pulpit unless you get me ready. If I get me ready, I'm going to get in there wrong. Lord, have mercy. Master, have mercy on many Washington. That's a powerful prayer. It's a perfect prayer. It's a practical prayer. And any prayer prayed in Jesus' name is powerful. It's an emergency prayer. It's an, emer it's an SOS. Uh, mercy, mercy. I'm at the end of my rope. Mercy meets us at midnight hour. 
Mercy meets us in the emergency room. Mercy, mercy meets us in the valley of desperation, Martha. Mercy meets us at the end of all hope. Jesus, my friend, is there with mercy. And his mercy is everlasting. No wonder David said it so much. His mercy is ever. His truth endures forever. The Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His truth, his mercy meets us in the person of our friend, the Lord Jesus Christ. And with his arms outstretched full of grace, with comfort, and that peace that passeth all understanding. He'll be there. He's there. Powerful prayer. Powerful prayer. Practical prayer. It's, why is it practical? It's practical because you know what? They didn't beat around the bush. They, they, they couldn't afford to. They were dying men. The, the flesh was rotting on their bodies. And, and they cut right to the chase. You know, practical. I, I'm not going to ask him for anything else. I, I'm not concerned about him getting me back to my family or, or making me look, look handsome. Or, no, give me mercy. Give me, I, I, I certainly believe, Matoya, that somewhere along the way, they, they had heard that blind man say that when he called Jesus. And they, oh, okay, so this is where mercy is found. This man has mercy. Uh, you can't buy mercy at the store. Uh, you, 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 can't, you can't get a pound of mercy. You, 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 got to get, you got to get your mercy from Jesus. He, he is the one who dispenses mercy. And so I like the way Jesus does this, but then he does everything well. In 1714, Luke 1714, Jesus didn't even bother to touch them. He was on his way to the cross. He didn't even, he, he heard them. He didn't turn to them and say, yes, I'll do it. He turned to them and said, go show yourselves to the priest. Now with the other guys, Matoya, he told those other two, you go to the priest, you know, and then you make your offering and all that. He says to these 10, uh, Go, go on your way. Go, you know, you know, go, go to the priest. But he didn't tell them anything about offerings. He didn't tell them anything. But I, now, I don't have the answer to that, but I, I really liked it. I really liked it. And, and, and it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. They were cleansed. They were cleansed as they went, as they went. I remember Pastor Washington looking into the Bible and hearing God say to him, call upon me, Carl, and I will answer you. And Carl didn't wait. Carl was obedient to that heavenly voice. And when he called on God, he was blind when he called on God. Going blind, but when he called on God, God rolled up into that room at Hopkins Hospital and a ball of light stopped at his bed, gave him his blessing, and went on his way. And the next day they left an everlasting testimony because Carl didn't see the light, but the men who were in the room who were not blind could testify that a supernatural light had rolled into the room, stopped at his bed, and when the doctors came, all they could say was, we don't need to do surgery. His sight is better than it was before. Praise be to thee, O God. And so here he is, he says, go, go, show yourselves unto the priest. He didn't tell them though about any offerings. Notice, comes to pass. Immediately, the death sentence was canceled. Immediately, immediately. The flesh became healthy, reconstructed from rotting flesh to healthy, vitalized, energetic, smooth, perfectly functioning bodies, good-looking faces, strong hands, legs, and feet. All of them, all 10 of them saw that they were completely healed. Nobody had to pronounce them clean. They could see that they were completely healed. And one of them breaks the ranks and runs away from the nine. And he heads back to Jesus, back to Jesus. And one of them, the scripture says, saw that he was healed and turned back. And, and Leon, he said, with a loud voice, with a loud voice, he glorified God. Entered into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. 
be thankful unto him and bless his name. A loud voice, a loud voice. He, he did public worship, unashamed worship, authentic, genuine worship, a loud voice. This is what the Lord was looking for from his people in the nation of Israel. Those Thanksgiving offerings were a time when prayers were to go up in loud worship and praise to Almighty God. There was no God like their God. Now, I know there's some of us here today who has received blessings from the Lord that made you just bust out and worship with a loud voice, a loud voice. I, I, I remember when I prayed and asked the Lord for the house on Brenbrook Drive because I wanted my sister out of the assisted living residence. Yes. And, and everything was working against me, Deacon Leonard, and even the guy who was going to sell the house said, you, you're retired, you're old, and, you know, and you, can't, you can't buy this house. And, and I went on back home and I, and I talked to my friend. I, I talked to him and I said, you're the one who knows why I want this house. I need to get my sister out of that place and get her in a place where she can be at home. And, and you know, he took his time doing it, and, but he just held me steady. Because if you got faith, the grain of a mustard seed, I declare unto you, you can move mountains. And he brought it to pass. Yeah, now, and, and I, I, I just got one more thing and I'll hurry on because I am watching the time. Um, uh, I, just, I just had here in my notes, Leon, and I'm so glad he's here. He would call the name of Jesus and worship, and it would just stir us up. Just stir us up. Uh, verse 16 says, as I hurry on, that when he got to Jesus, he did what the people were supposed to do at the altar in the nation of Israel. <laughs> he fell down on his face at the feet of Jesus and began giving him thanks, giving him thanks. And that little postscript there, and he was a Samaritan. And, and he was a Samaritan. And he, he was a lowlife, which means that those other nine who went along, they were Jews. So when he turned around to come back, they were not going to follow him. He had never led anybody, he was a Samaritan. And the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritan. But when they became lepers, they put them all in the same leper camp. There was no racial distinction in the leper camp. Everybody in there was condemned to die. And so here he comes back. Here, raw, unrehearsed worship. Full, unashamed worship. Thanksgiving, glorifying God with all his mind, heart, soul, and strength. And when you pray, like he prayed in Jesus name and you ask for all of heaven's resources to make available be made available to you at once there is a supernatural power in the name of Jesus these, these lepers and this leper especially must have heard of the blind man as I said but they also must have heard that one day when he was teaching he said you can ask anything <laughs> in my name. See, the rumors had spread uh, uh, all, all over about Jesus. They, they must have heard somebody say, you know, he, he could steal the water. He, he calmed the sea. And, and, and he says, he says this, this is that Jesus. We, we, better, we better get him now. And they, when they said, Master again, they put their lives under his control. Many of us need to do that now. We really do need to put our lives under the control of somebody greater than us. And then we won't be feeling so depressed and dejected and out of sorts. And we will be able to rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and, and give thanks in everything. We heard, he said, he heard their prayer. It was a perfect prayer. Have mercy on us. It was a collective prayer. Prayed with one voice, touching and agreeing. All of them wanting the same thing. But in the end, in the end was a practical prayer, but in the end, only one returned. Only one of them returned. Well, Jesus put himself at their disposal. He, he put himself at their disposal and they took the opportunity. 
uh, that song, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. And Pastor used to say that this at uh, invitation time. Jesus is passing this way, this that way. And he opens an, a window of opportunity for them to have a life-changing experience. They eagerly took advantage of it. But only one of them came back to give glory to his name and say, thank you, Jesus. Because these nine men didn't come back, they missed out on a special favor, a one-time opportunity that was bestowed upon this stranger, this Samaritan. They missed the day of their salvation. They missed the day. That day will not come back to them again because they were face to face with God, the giver of life. And they knew that he was not a mere man. They had been lepers for years. They were dying. But in Jesus was life. And the life was the light of men and the light shined in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. So saints, man still looks on the outward appearance. But God looks on the heart. And he saw the faith in the heart of this Samaritan lying at his feet, giving him the sacrifice of thanksgiving. And he in turn gave him eternal life. This morning I'd like for us to think about how God thinks about the sacrifice of thanksgiving. How important it is to him that we actively consider his feelings about the way we show our gratitude to him. Uh, there's some folk come when they get ready, when the church was open, when the building was open, they came when they got ready. They, 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 didn't, they didn't come in the fellowship and the assembly to be together with others. They would come late and leave early. And when the church shut down, uh, there were some of them who said, oh, we'll be so glad when the, church, when the building opens again. And those of us who come regularly just smiled. So that's why these nine people are a classic example of those kinds of people and of the nation of Israel who insulted God day by day by their refusal to give him thanks. It was God who had made the altar available. God made the beast and the animals available. He told them that they belong to me. He said, the reason, the reason you, can't, you can't give me anything, it all belongs to me. I, I, made, I made the goats and the bulls and the lambs. I'm everything you're giving to me. I made it. And so all I ask you to do is to give me a sacrifice of praise. The one Samaritan is the classic example who poured out his heart and soul in real thanksgiving to the Lord who deserved it. And he did it in faith. Jesus said, by faith, he saw his faith. He saw a full faith. He saw a faith that believed that Jesus was who he is. The nation of Israel somehow had become unaware of who God is. It, it seems incredible. He brought them through the Red Sea. He brought them out of the wilderness. He, 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 they knew him in real time, and yet they treated him like he was a man. Uh, well, we're either with the nine, or we're with the one. <laughs> I said a few Sundays ago, you're either in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, or you're in the Garden of Gethsemane and willing to surrender to the very will of God. You're in one place or the other. And today we are either with the nine or with the one. We don't want to miss the opportunity to get from God what he has to give to us because we can't get it anywhere else. We know full well that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord, who are the called according to his purpose. So it's not a risk. But it is a risk for those of you who are not his today, for those of you who are not in Christ. 
So I'm asking you as I close, in the name of Jesus, to surrender your heart to the Lord. He loves you. He wants you to receive the gift of eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ. Christ gave his life for you that you could have the golden opportunity to be reconciled with God, our Father, and become a member of his family. Jesus came to save sinners. If you're a sinner, you're eligible for salvation. Take opportunity while you're still eligible and able because any minute you might be in eternity. And there are two places you can go. One is heaven and one is hell and you can't go but one place. And you can't change your mind on your way as you're going. You got to know before you go. You see, those of us who are here today know. We know. Don't we know? We, we know. We know. We are sure. We are sure. We're not sure because we are good saints. We are sure because Jesus saved us. He saved us with his blood on a cruel cross. Jesus saved us. And he saved us once and for all. And he secured a place for us in heaven. He went back to glory and he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And where I am there, ye may be also. And we are looking forward to that because Jesus is coming back again. And all of the scripture says to us, until he comes, you proclaim this gospel, that Jesus is the son of God who came into the world to save sinners. This is your golden opportunity. In Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. That's better than collecting the wages of sin, which is death. Today you can have the gift of God, which is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. God bless you today. God keep you today. God lift you today. God bless you today and give you courage and give you joy so that you can rejoice evermore. The Bible says at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. So just get at his right hand and just have you a shouting good time wherever you are. Gracious Father, now in the name of Jesus we come thanking you for the blessed opportunity to be able to say thank you Jesus thank you Jesus thank you Jesus thank you Jesus thank you Lord thank you Jesus thank you for health and strength thank you for food and shelter and clothing thank you Lord God more than all of these thank you for the shed blood the blood that you shed out on Calvary. Thank you for the suffering you bore, the suffering that we should have taken. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you for your resurrection. Thank you that you keep your promises. Thank you that we know that one day the trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ will rise, and we will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. It's in his name, now, Father, that we say the Lord bless you and keeps you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Give you his peace in his precious name. Hallelujah and amen.